and first of all, thank you for coming. Normally, I'm the one that's behind. If anyone who attends a million online talk, they know that I'm the one that sits behind the scenes, and normally Jonathan's in the front. But on this occasion, Jonathan can't join us today, so I'm doing the welcome uh, for this uh, talk. And of course, it's unusual in the sense that we're returning to some live events. I will be mentioning a few more uh, at the end. So thank you for coming, but also at fairly short notice because our guest speaker this evening, Alan Merkin, is en route between the Edinburgh Festival, where you've been the, the, the lecturing and talking about your project, and you're going down towards Australia, where you're exhibiting. Which So we're very delighted that he's making a pit stop here. Through various connections, I was tipped off and I thought, why not let's see what we can let's invite him to come. So, who is Alan Merkin? Well, he was born in Australia, uh, where he was a member of the Socialist Bund, is that right? Bund? Bund. Bund, Bund organisation before coming observant and joining the Nikiva movement. He qualified in law, anthropology and sound engineering. I'm not sure that's a combination you do at the English University, but that's pretty impressive. <laughs> sound engineering and law, that's a good one. Made earlier in 1990, he worked as a government litigator and you were directly the official to receive his office. Yes, Ooh, yes. That's interesting. Good. Then you travelled through Asia, writing stories and photography, and then, like many organisations and groups, during COVID, ran Zoom workshops for kids stuck at home when schools were closed, and you started to get the kids out exploring the hills around Jerusalem for springs, ruins, and other wonders. We then began volunteering in a community garden where you started to photograph activities that were going on while gardening. Post lockdown, you were holding uh, exhibit exhibitions, running workshops, and today you're now going to be talking about your. I'm going to get this right. Quotidian, 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 quotidian. Oh yes, there is that quotidian. Your late, your most recent Israeli exhibit, and you've just published a book called Distilling Jerusalem. So, um, as I said, passing through Leeds, staying with friends that I know, and it's all come together. So I'd like to welcome the evening speaker. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, just uh, some preliminaries. I'm going to be wearing this little bag here because it makes me look more like a traveller and it gives me a little bit of security in my identity. So that's, that's number one. Number two, just like uh, I always have an issue when I talk whether I should sit or stand, and I guess it's psychological because I know Friday Night Kiddish there are some people who stand and they expect everybody else to stand as well. So if you don't mind, I'm going to stand, you can all sit. You do, you'll be seated, you don't have to feel that you need to stand as well. That's number two. Um, I'd like to thank, firstly, Milim for uh, hosting this evening and uh, having invited me. I'd also like to thank uh, uh, the uh, Ottman family, that's uh, uh, Mickey and Simon, for hosting my self uh, <laughs> while, I'm, while I'm in Leeds uh, talking to you. Um, okay, it is true that I've just come from Edinburgh, where I was, a, I was exhibiting during the Edinburgh Festival, the Fringe Festival, um, and I, that doesn't mean that this is a stand-up comedic performance. <laughs> okay, so I, I hope you're all, you're all okay with that. Um, but I will, uh, I, what I'd like to do is speak, uh, obviously, about photography. And um, just to give you a little uh, breakdown of what I'll speak about, firstly, I'll just say a few uh, words about uh, photography in general. Then I'm going to discuss my transition into being a photographer and uh, how that's uh, relevant to the way I take my photos. Um, then we'll discuss uh, street photography and finally um, I will show you the photographs. We couldn't exhibit my photographs uh, on the walls, but I'll uh, uh, share the photographs with you and we can discuss them. Um, so I will put up, I will start with putting up some photographs in the background. Okay, so I did actually just come from the Edinburgh Festival and um, I'm putting this up <laughs> just to show you, yes, I was in fact there. Um, I was staying with the rabbi, so I'll take this uh, opportunity to thank uh, Rabbi Rose and uh, the whole of the Edinburgh community for helping me and supporting me in this uh, venture. But as you can see, it was a, it was a fun event. And uh, that gave me my first photograph for street photography in Edinburgh. But we are going to be talking about Israel mostly. Um, okay. Now, the question is, why do people take photographs? 
So in the old days, when photographs first started, it was to memorialise an event. It was to uh, save, uh, to, to capture a moment for the future. That was the initial idea of taking photos. That has changed, but we'll just talk about that for a moment. So I'm going to show you, let's see why this is not jumping. Oh, I see. Sorry about this. Let's go down to here. Oops. There we go. We'll start with this one. So this is a photograph taken approximately 1944-1945. This is my mother. I'm pretty sure that this is my uncle. And uh, according to that timeline, this should have been taken in either Russia or in France, where they moved on to. Now, there's so much that we can understand from a photograph. So, you have a look at the clothing, the patterns on the clothing, the background, the way they've got their hair done up. It's, it really does capture a, a, a moment, not just a moment, an era. Now, in my family, we used to call these Russian photos. Because in, Russian, in Russia, nobody smiled. Just didn't happen, people didn't smile. So, these are what we call Russian photos. And I'll mention, I'll discuss that in a second. This was taken around the same time in Australia. And this is my father. Now, my father passed away when I was six years old. But it's a very interesting, instructive experience for me. Firstly, it was in Australia, people are smiling. But they look happy. It's a whole different milieu. Now, for me, it's also interesting. People always told me that I'm very much like my father. And uh, thank you very much. Um, I like to think personality-wise, perhaps I'm like my father. But uh, it's, it's very interesting to see what we can learn about, about things from photographs. So this is all about memorialising an incident or a period of time. Now, uh, I'll, I'll just move on from that for a second. In, uh, about 40 years ago, uh, I came to Israel and my mother gave me a very small camera. And my sister had just moved to Israel. She was living there at the time with her oldest daughter. And uh, they were living in Rukhot. Her husband was working in the Weizmann Institute, the scientific institute. And it was a very, very, there was a very, very hot day. Rukhot is very hot and humid. So my sister was there. I spoke to her on the phone. She sounded so depressed. She was stuck at home with the baby. It was stinking hot. There was no air conditioning. I thought, I've got to do something. So I went over to visit her. And when I got there, I thought, what can I do to put her into a better mood? And I said, you know what? We're going to take some Russian photos. <laughs> so what we did was we rifled through all the drawers, put on all sorts of different strange clothing, and sat there and tried as hard as we could not to smile. And we put up the self-timer on the photo, on the camera, and we sat it on the windowsill, and we went, <laughs> did everything that we could not to laugh, and of course, we laughed. And by the end of the day, we were in such a fantastic mood, it was like having a pillow fight. We were just, it, it was wonderful. So I realised in that moment that photography is much more than just capturing a moment. It's a way of engaging. It's a way of becoming self-conscious. It's a way of relaxing. It, there's so much you can do with photography. But that was the instant for me that changed my whole relationship with photography. So it's like... Uh, it can also be used as an icebreaker. That's the wonderful thing about photography. So I'm going to show you one or two other things here. So for instance, this one is not from Israel. This was taken uh, two weeks ago in Edinburgh. But you can see I was walking past a cafe. And look at these two girls here. Now they started jumping up and down when they saw me taking my photo. Because they wanted to engage with me. They said, oh, here's this bloke who's come along. He's taking a photo. Let's get his attention! And they started doing all sorts of weird stuff. And you can see she's just, she's just starting there. I had already broken that glass barrier between people. And it was wonderful. And it can be used as a tool. Here is another one. This one's in Israel. This is at a winery that I went to. Uh, there's a particular um, uh, uh, monastery which makes, also makes wine. And you can come along on the weekends and uh, drink wine and, and it, it, it have cheese and all that sort of 
that sort of thing. Now, the moment I walk in with my camera, not my phone, my camera, people see a camera today, they change when they see you. And so they all started saying, hey! And everybody started trying to get my attention. <laughs> it's a fantastic tool, like I said, to break that barrier between people. Now, of course, I spent another 15 minutes photographing these people, and it was just, it was just absolutely adorable. So that's, uh, that's using it as, a, as an icebreaker. Today's a very different story. Everybody has a camera. Everybody. So what happens is people today, they're not trying to, uh, they're not trying to memorialize an event. They're not trying to capture something for the future. What they want is to engage now. It's about taking photos and sharing them in real time. That's what it's about. So after you've taken your 450 photos today, you delete them. You, well, you either delete them or you put them onto a database where Google has now changed its, uh, changed its rules. Google has a photographic database. It's changed its rules and says, if you don't interact with our database in two years, we're going to wipe everything. Because the world has proliferated with photos that have absolutely no meaning. But the point is, the meaning is now. There's a wonderful story about a couple that came for a romantic evening to a restaurant. And they walk in, they sit down, they order their dinner. The waiter comes in a few minutes or 10 minutes later, he brings them their, their food and walks away. Now, normally, a waiter comes back in about 15, 20 minutes, and what does the waiter say? Anyone? Everything all right. Is everything all right? So, of course, the waiter came back and said, is everything all right? And they said, Yes, why? And he says, well, you've been here 10 minutes. You haven't photographed your food yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the way it is today. Do you think these people want to remember in 10 years what they had at that meal? No. They want to send it to their friends <laughs> so that their friends can see it. That's the craziness of photography today. Now, um, many years ago, I started traveling. When I, left, when I left law, one of the things that I did was um, I started going to Asia. I actually, left, I'll share with you that I left law because uh, amongst other things, I, I became ill. And so I decided, seeing as I couldn't work properly, I thought, you know what, just go and relax. Get out of everything that you know. So I went to Asia and I floated around Asia for a while. After a year or two, I thought to myself, you know, every time I take a photograph, it could be a, a postcard. What's the point? I might as well buy a postcard, it's, it's easier, and somebody's got a better camera or takes a better photo than me, what's the point? And then I decided, you know, what I really need is somebody to take photos of me, or somebody that I can take photos of, so that I can make, a, make my mark on the world, right? So, uh, as it happens, in 2006, I, was, uh, I had gone to Australia, and I was leaving Australia on my way to Vietnam, and I was introduced to a girl, an Australian girl, um, who had never travelled. She didn't have a passport. She was very excited about travelling. She couldn't believe that there I was, you know, going on all of these interesting trips. So uh, I offered to bring her with me on condition that she learned to take my photo. Surprisingly, she did, and it wasn't that bad at all. So we started writing stories about our... our uh, she was not Jewish. We started writing stories about our experiences. We could discuss... Thing, you know, we went to China for a few months. We could discuss with each other different things that we'd seen, the one-child policy, um, what it felt like having all the soldiers everywhere, all sorts of interesting things. So we, uh, we put out a book on China. And um, often, photography is so important to be able to make, make these things accessible, especially in today's world, where people are much more visually oriented than, uh, than uh, liturgically, is that how you put it, uh, than, than through words. So here is uh, the book uh, that we made at that time. Her name's Penelope. Um, this was, uh, we were on a farm in uh, China, uh, in the Yunnan province, and uh, she's sitting here at breakfast reading the, um, <laughs> reading the, uh, uh, the travel book. Okay, now it's actually very interesting because, you know, I mean, I'm Jewish, she's a marsupial. It's a very, very different <laughs> culture. And uh, it was very, very exciting to be able to, to have that experience with her. She then joined me after this at uh, a Pesach Seder. And uh, she came up with such, she asked many questions about the Seder, which 
I haven't grown up with it, wouldn't have even thought of. So, and that's actually on the internet, it's available to read. Um, very interesting, a lot of fun. This is the back of the book. You can see she, was, she got really into taking, taking photos. Of course, uh, she's only a little thing, so you know, somebody would have to position the camera, camera for her. But uh, it, 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 it did quite well. So that was a really, really nice, interesting, interesting uh, uh, relationship. Um, she is here in Leeds, but uh, you know, time's gone by. She's very tired, so um, and the koalas do sleep a lot, so she's uh, resting at home. But the bottom line is, the rule that I learned from this is, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that, that you can see that we're using an SLR. SLR is a, like a, a, a big regular camera, and they're very, very heavy. And so often, partly because of her, and partly because of you know who wants to schlep this heavy thing everywhere. Sometimes you just don't take the photos because you go out somewhere and you say, oh, I can't be bothered taking this heavy thing. So you leave it. And I, that's what I learned. You know, I need something smaller. Does anybody here know what the best model camera is today on the market? No? It's the one you have. It's the one you have. So don't, don't look and see What's the, what's the bigger one, the best one, the most expensive one, the one with the most pixels, which is what everybody says today? It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant, because if the thing's too heavy to schlep, you're not going to use it. It's the one you've got with you. So that was the rule that I learned from this particular, uh, this particular experience. With time, and speaking of time, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't checking the time. Okay. With, with time, what time are we until now? Right, past nine, you said. Oh, right. An hour. So with time, um, uh, the whole world got stuck with COVID. So what was I going to do during COVID? We were all casting around for some way to keep ourselves occupied. Well, with the lockdowns, I couldn't go far. Where could I go? Up. I, I, I don't necessarily mean Kodja Borokho, I mean, uh, but because <laughs> uh, you can't photograph Kodja Borokho unless you've got a really good camera. But um, I decided to start looking at birds. So I started photographing birds. And that was really, really exciting. Now, I don't have a 600 millimeter lens, if you know what that is. I don't have one of these really long things that look like a cannon to take a proper photo of birds. But I said, Alan, use what you've got. You don't need anything else. And that's what I started to do. Oops, sorry, this is uh, just more of Penelope. I'm sorry, I could have... Uh, that's... Uh, you get an idea of our travels. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, but I started taking photos of birds. Now, in Jerusalem, behind the uh, Knesset is, a, is uh, the Jerusalem um, Centre for Bird Research. It's called the JBO, or the Jerusalem Bird Observatory. So they have some bird hides there in a little pond. So I came there one day and I was sitting down uh, very quietly as one does at a bird hide and I'm looking around to see these birds. And I've got my, my camera, which is not a phone, but you know, it's about this big. And I'm sitting there very quietly. Now, on this side of me was a young man who had, who as he comes down, very cool, calm, and suavely sits down pulls out a tripod which looks like a hunk of, a hunk of, uh, like an anvil, like a hunk of metal, and he sits it, pulls it out and sits it on the thing, brings out this massive camera that, he, that needs to be held sturdily, and then he starts looking. Excuse me, there's an elderly fellow sitting on my other side, right, and he's sitting there with a slightly smaller lens but also huge, and at some point they start saying, whoa, look what I took! And he's, he shows us the pictures, this guy says, no, look at mine. Mine, I've got a better lens than you. And this one, this one cost me 6,000 shekels. What's that? That's about one and a half, you know, 1,200 pounds or something. My, my, my lens is better. And this guy says, yes, but I've got a feature on my camera where I can flick a switch and it doubles the power of the lens. And then I said, I'm just taking a photo. And they all looked at me like, <laughs> it was the funniest thing in the world. This is one of the photos I took. And I said to myself, if I'm going to be traveling, I'm not going to be carrying a tripod the size, like the, the weight of an anvil, just so that I can put up my camera. And I'm not going to be spending all these thousands and thousands on, on equipment that I don't need. Because you know what? I'm not doing this as a job. 
this is all I need. That, of course, is a kingfisher. That's a common kingfisher, which we have, we have three kingfishers in Israel. The common kingfisher, the uh, white-throated kingfisher, and the, uh, and the pied kingfisher. All beautiful birds. Here, here's another one that I took on that same day. And um, I see absolutely nothing wrong with that photograph for my purposes. It's enough for me to say to people, look what I saw. I love this. And it prints fine. So I very much believe in using what you've got. For my purposes, what I've got is enough. Then I discovered, I, a friend of mine is a member of the, uh, has set up a, a Facebook page called uh, Bird Watchers for English Speakers in Israel. And I started putting up pictures and I discovered at some point that the head of the bird observatory was watching me. And I'll just show you some of the, some of the photos. Just a small selection of the photos. These are some of the ones that I took mm -hmm. and that I put up. That's an Indian minor bird. That's a pied kingfisher. They, they fish. Um, that's an Egyptian goose. <laughs> now, all of this is with my regular camera. Nothing special. And my camera is considered amateur. Okay? So, the the uh, head of the bird watch of the uh, Jerusalem Bird Observatory calls me up and says, listen, can you do me a favour? I said, sure. She says, can you come and speak at a conference that we're having at the Bird Observatory about photographing birds? And I'm thinking, but I don't have one of those big lenses. What are you talking about? She says, no, no, please, please come. So I said, okay. So I came along and I spoke at the Bird Observatory. Just before we started, I was chatting with some people at the breakfast, some of the people who were attending, and I came to a lady and I said, so do you like photographing birds? She says, um, I'm not quite there yet. What does that mean, I'm not quite there yet? Just do it, There's, you know, don't have to prove anything to anybody, it's, it's wonderful. It's about enjoying, and so enjoying was my next rule. It's about enjoying nothing else. This is not our job. This is for love and for fun. So I speak at the, at the uh, I'm the third speaker out of three, and the other two have got fantastic equipment and their photographs are phenomenal. My heart's dropping. I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. Anyway, I give a talk. It goes off very well. And the second speaker, who is a former entomologist and in my opinion, a leading ornithologist at the moment, she comes to me and she says, oh my God, I love your pictures. <laughs> and I said, how is that possible? She says, do me a favor, I live in the desert. Why don't you come to me for the, to, to be with me for a week to the desert and we'll go bird watching. So I did. So, and all of this, I never saw myself as a photographer. And these people are all starting to get attracted to me. So I went to her, we got into her Jeep and we drove off for hours through the desert. I saw the most phenomenal things. This is my, one of my prize photos. Okay, this is called a, sooty, a migrating sooty falcon. Now to see this, we actually had to drive for an hour and then climb up uh, the side of a cliff. And these are uh, fairly rare birds to see and it had come and it was, it was um, uh, nesting there in the, in the desert. Anyway, that's, that's just one of my, one of my fun, uh, fun photos. Then, Let's see. As it happens, also during lockdown, we could walk at some stage around a kilometre from my home. I, I went for a walk and I discovered something called uh, community gardens. Now, at the Museum of Natural History in Jerusalem, of which I am now a member of the executive, there is a, there is a, uh, the, the compound around the, uh, the muse excuse me, the museum was abandoned for many years. And, so uh, before developers came, somebody, somebody else came and, and set up a community gardens there and started planting. And it's now absolutely stunning. Some of the members here tonight have been there, have seen it. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. There are parts of it that look, look like Monet's garden. And I decided, oh my God, I have to be part of this, mm -hmm. part of this enterprise. So I went and I joined. Now very soon I realized, while we're doing our gardening, that everybody is coming along and enjoying what they're seeing. They, they like the green, they like the smell, they like the sounds, but they can't identify what it is that they like. And I thought, you know what? I can show them. And so I started photographing and sharing the pictures. And now they're, it's regularly on the website and on other things. So very soon they came to me and they said, listen, do us a favor. 
will you, can we hold an exhibition for you? Which is what they did. Um, I don't think, I'm not at this minute, I won't show you photos from that exhibition, but uh, uh, these are some of the pictures that I, that I took there of the nature and, where is this going? Of the nature and of other things. This is the inside of a flower. Now, how I, the other thing is you really need to be inventive. So how did I take this photo? I actually, somebody had thrown out onto the street a slide projector. And so what I did was I ripped the lens out of it and I sticky taped it to the end of my camera and turned it into what they call a macro lens, which means it's something that takes a photo of, of, of something else very, very, very close. And uh, so that, that's the inside of a, a particular flower. And I have a whole collection of photographs like that. This is also using the same the same lens. That is not, that's just using my regular lens. Uh, this is a poppy. And of course there's all the people who come to sit in the gardens to enjoy. Now I'll just say, I, I love this photo because you feel you're engaging with that person. You can experience what they're experiencing. If you have a look here, this flower gives you the feeling a little bit like your your you're looking, going into their experience. There's something special about that. This photograph here, we, were, we have a little orchard there, so we were picking pears, and um, there was a competition held. So I was a bit embarrassed because there were three uh, categories of photographs. They allowed me to put, I got a telephone call from the municipality which said, listen, will you, will you, we want to see what your entries are for this for this competition. I said, well, I don't really, I can't be bothered. Please, please, please. So I put in photos. They put them into two categories and I was a bit embarrassed because I won both categories. And it was, it was not very nice for me because I felt this is a communal effort and I want other people to have a go. And just because, just because I'm there and I'm taking my photos, everybody should be allowed to enjoy and to, to get, um, you do what's that mean, the encouragement to be involved in all of this. This was the second category that I, I went with. So these are the two categories. This was called communal life. Okay. Now, as it happens, we have other people who come to the gardens, who sing and who perform and who enjoy all together. So um, these were three artists who came and were singing and uh, I made some videos for them and uh, it was really a lot of fun. Everybody enjoyed. People started to gather around to hear them singing and performing and it was nice to know that there were international artists who were, who were coming <laughs> to the gardens and uh, being recorded for posterity. Uh, let's see. Oops. Sorry. Now I just need to jump forward with this. And I'll take myself off that screen. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so I would, let's move over to street photography. There was a guy that came to me and he said, Hey, I hear you like taking photos. I said, yeah. He said, Well, how about I'll come to Jerusalem? He lived in Ranana. He said, which is about an hour and a half north of uh, Jerusalem. He says, how about I'll come to Jerusalem? I love taking photos. I said, okay. So we made an arrangement and he came to Jerusalem, we went for a drink, and then we went walking, taking photos of people in the street. Now the first person we came across who looked really interesting was this guy. His name's uh, Moshe Brahman, I think it is. And uh, he's from, originally from Tunisia. Lovely, lovely fellow. So when we saw him, he actually, this is what we saw. So we immediately pulled out our cameras and taking photos. Turns out he's a street photographer. So we ended up with a long chat with this fellow and I discovered that he only takes photos in black and white. And until then, the last time I'd taken a photo in black and white was when I had my little Kodak Instamatic when I was 10 years old. You know when you press the button and it goes clunk, clunk. And when you put the flash on, the whole thing burns out and the plastic melts, right, when you use the flat. So I looked at his photos and I thought, ah, black and white doesn't do it for me. For some reason, I liked this guy so much, I thought, you know what, give it a shot. I spent the next three days taking photos in black and white and it changed my life. I absolutely adore black and white. So uh, you find, I find that with black and white, you're not dazzled by all of the colours. 
which is extra information that you don't actually need, depending on what you're looking at. My purpose in photography, especially in street photography, is to engage with the subject. Now, I don't mean speaking to them personally, although we'll discuss that in a minute. I mean, um, I want to get into their experience. I want to feel what they're feeling. I want to understand what they are uh, living through. And once you start working with shading and uh, things like that, you become much more focused on the person. And that is all due to this fella. And um, I, uh, I tell him every once in a while when I bump into him on the street. And uh, <coughs> any time I speak to other photographers, they know all about him. He's a, he's a very, very, very sweet fellow. Now, part of this experience was very uncomfortable. Why? Because as soon as we uh, met this guy, we started walking, the three of us. Remember, I had come out to photograph with another gentleman. So the three of us were walking along. Now, this other guy, who happened to have been British, and I think he might have been from Liverpool, I'm not sure, he was certainly a northerner. But he, as we were walking around, he saw some kids who were playing on the doorstep of a store, some Ethiopian kids. Now, he didn't have a big camera with a big zoom like me, or a zoom like me. He only had his phone. So what did he do? He surreptitiously went around and took a photo. And then he saw nobody stopped him. So he came right up to the kids in a very offensive and intrusive manner, and he took photos. And then he took a whole lot of photos. Started walking away. Now, the kids' mothers were in the store, and they noticed. And they walked out and said, excuse me, what do you think you're doing? Oh, we don't want our kids photographed. Delete it immediately. And what did he say? I've, I've got the right to take a photo. I have copyright over my photo, which is true. By law, he has copyright over his photo. That's a separate issue to, to, to privacy. But copyright, he owns over the photo. And he said, by law, I can keep this photo. And the mother started screaming at him. And he said, I, I'm not going to delete it. When they screamed more, he said, I'll delete it when I get home. Of course, he was, he was being nasty, I think is the, the, the nicest word I can use. Within minutes, we had about 50 people standing around us. It was extremely embarrassing. And I said to him, I don't understand you. Delete the photos. This is meant to be about being happy. Remember our other rule? It's about being happy and enjoying life and letting other people enjoy life. If somebody doesn't want their photo taken, don't take it. It's okay. In four seconds, you'll find something else to take a photo of. There is an infinitesimal number of things to take photos of. Skip it. He couldn't skip it. Uh, I managed to extricate myself from the situation and from him. Uh, I won't go on with that whole story because the point has been made. But uh, the idea is this is all about being happy and respecting people. Now, unfortunately, a lot of street photographers are more involved with being intrusive and being peeping toms. So there's another, there's a woman in the building uh, where I live who also, she loves street photography. Every single photograph she takes is from behind. You see people with strange dress, walking like this, sort of. It's always from behind. You realise she has no concept of street photography. She's not trying to get into their mind. She just wants to say that she saw somebody who looked weird. And I'm sorry, but that doesn't cut it for me, right? So anyway, I'm saying this because this is all very, very important part of street photography, in my opinion, as an art. Also because street photography, to me, is a sociological experience. It's not just about, can I press a button and capture something? It's about engaging, it's about learning and understanding. So, uh, now, we spoke about copyright, about how this guy had copyright over that photograph. Here's a very, very interesting little story, and that's this story. Does anybody know anything about this photograph? You've seen it before, but do you know about the, the story? You do know the story? Yeah. Does anybody else know the story here? So there was, a, a, there was a guy, a photographer, nature photographer, who decided that he wanted to, um, he wanted to take some close-ups of these, these uh, macaws, these, these uh, monkeys. So he came around, macaques I think they're called, he came around and he set up a system of cameras where he could leave, go somewhere from it at a distance, and they would activate the cameras. It worked. 
And this was the photo that he liked the most. He put it on the internet, it went totally viral, which means that everybody was sharing it with everybody. Suddenly, this guy who should have made a lot of money from his work got nothing because everybody was sharing it. And he said, oh my God, I've lost at least 12,000 pounds from all this, what am I gonna do? So he sued a particular publication that was using this photograph and he came to court and said, I have copyright over this photo. And what did the court say? It's the photographer that has the copyright. <laughs> oh, that's the photographer. <laughs> it's a selfie. It's a selfie, exactly. So PETA got involved. You know PETA, the, the uh, animal rights organization? <laughs> and they said, well, actually, the money, uh, the, the copyright belongs to the monkey. So the court said, well, where's the money going to go? What's the monkey going to do with it? And uh, Pepper said, well, we need to give it as part, uh, we need to collect it and use it for the family of monkeys. And so then the court said, ah, but there's a problem because we don't know if the monkey that you're representing is this monkey. <laughs> The story goes on and on, but the point is that copyright does belong to the photographer. Now, I've noticed since I've been here in, in Edinburgh and also here in, in uh, the UK, in uh, England, that uh, there's a, a very strong sensitivity to getting release forms and getting, getting people to, to, excuse me, to agree to having their photo taken. I tend to, where I can, I like to get people's cooperation. I like to ask people and I come and I share with them the photos and I say, would you mind being in a photograph? I think you've got something special. Do you mind if I photograph you? And I'll share it with you. And that way there's a fair exchange. And then it's nice. And people usually like that. And then I know that I've got their permission. And I get some phenomenal uh, photographs. There was an amazing one uh, I showed earlier on of a guy in a kilt. That was amazing. <laughs> and that didn't take too much, uh, too much convincing. I said, <laughs> Now, as it happens, I'm in the gardens one day where I'm taking lots of photographs and this very attractive woman walks in. So I, we were having a, a marketplace, a very attractive woman walks in and I go up to her and I was trying to decide should I, shouldn't I, because also as a, as a young man, you know, I don't want people to think that I'm being inappropriate with them. But I said, listen, I think you have something special, do you mind if I photograph you? And she thought for a moment and then said, okay. I said, terrific. So she's got these cute kids, and I photograph them, then her husband comes in, and I photograph the family. After I take the photos, and I'm really excited, of course, and after I take the photos, I say, listen, I'm gonna share them with you. Where, where do you want me to send them to? And she says, my email. So the husband, so I said, oh, that's fine, what's, um, what's your email? She says, it's my name. I said, what's your name? And the husband says, you don't know my name? I said, no. And, uh, and he says, she's a photographer. I said, okay. I still don't know her name. And he says, her name's Michal. Fatal. I said, okay. He says, she's a well-known photographer. <laughs> okay, fine. So I, I'm trying to act cool and I take down her details and I go home and I look her up and I am blown away by her photography. And I learned a whole new thing about photography by looking at her stuff. Now, actually, I put a, one, a photograph that I took of her and her daughter, I put in the book that I just published, and I showed it to her, and she was very, very excited about it. So that, for me, was a bit more validation, if you like. So I'll show you a couple of things that I just took from her website. And you see, it's about getting into somebody's mind, getting into an experience. Now, if somebody who is not a professional photographer showed you that photo, you'd say, oh yeah, but it's a sort of, it's a bit all over the place, isn't it? It's wide, and this bit's not in focus, and you've only got half a bit of it. But knowing that somebody professional took the photograph, you'd say, wow, she's really brought us into an experience, right? You can either say yes or not say anything. So it's all <laughs> <laughs> um, here's another one she took. Now, with that, Normally, you'd look at it and you'd say, well, that's somebody trying to take a photo, but they couldn't quite get there, and they only took the back of his head. But it shows the solitude. It shows uh, the Prime Minister, Bibi. It says, he's in thought. Look, his, his hand's there, the way he's sort of 
trying to hold himself together. It's a fascinating photo. And that changed me for street photography. And also changed the file, which I'm meant to be looking at now. Okay. Um, one second. All right, so I have a series of simple rules about photography, which I now share with people, which I think they're fairly obvious, but um, I'll share them anyway. Number one, the most important camera is something that's convenient. Because if you're not gonna take it with you, then you haven't taken the shot. Better to take the shot with a less good camera than it is to not take the shot at all. Okay, that's number one. Number two, there's something called the 2080 rule. I'm sure some of you have heard of it. The problem in the world is that most people invest 80% uh, of their energies in anything to get a 20% result. Most business people will tell you, you need to invest 20% of your energy to get an 80% result. And that's the same thing here. So the most important thing is to hold the camera straight. <laughs> right? That's far better than buying a $20,000 camera and still not holding the camera straight. You're gonna get the same result. In fact, it'll be worse because you'll be able to see more clearly how you didn't hold it straight. <laughs> right. Um, now, I don't know if you know anything about processing and digital photography. So there's something called JPEG and something called RAW. When you have a camera, you can, in, in digital photography, you can save the picture that you've taken in such a way that um, you are able to manipulate it afterwards and do many, many more things with it to clean it up. There is a compressed version. In other words, you can set the camera to, to decide how to do all of that by itself. If you do that, you've saved a lot of time, but there's a lot you can't do afterwards, right? That's called JPEG. That's the, the, the second version. I only photograph in JPEG. I don't use the other one. Because I say, if you're going to take the photo, better to take it right now, better to take a better photo now, and I'm happy to give up on my ability to manipulate afterwards. Now, I know that I could do amazing things with it, but to manipulate one photo can take five hours. Why do it? If what you can do for your purposes is easy right from the beginning. There are some people here who I know won't necessarily agree with me, and that's fine, because it depends what you want. At the end of the day, you're not looking to get the same results as a big professional photographer. I try to tell people, what do you need a big camera for that's going to have the quality that you can make a huge poster that will sit on a building of a, of a, a, a supermodel? You're not out doing that. Most of the cameras today on a phone can take photos much, much better for your purposes. And you know, the way phones are designed today, you can even take better photos. I can take often better portraits with my phone than I can with my camera. Now, I could, I could change that if I went out and spent a whole lot of money on lenses and things, but why? Why? And you'll see in a minute, we'll have a look at some of the, the photos from the, um, from the exhibit that I, that I had. Okay. Um, now, the next thing is tell a story. Photos need to tell a story. Having a photograph of two people from behind walking this way doesn't tell you anything. Tell a story. If you look at a picture and you feel there's a story involved, or you feel ask, you're asking yourself, where are they coming from? Where are they going to? Why are they doing this? What are they feeling? You've told a story, and then it becomes magical. Somebody needs to look at that and say, oh, that looks nice. Nah, what's the point? Right? You want to get into it and say, wow, I relate to that. That's telling a story. The next thing, a part of that is give context. What do I mean by that? Somebody will take a photograph of a big forest and then they'll show you the pictures. Oh my God, isn't that amazing? I don't, what are you looking at? That flower, what flower? That flower! It's somewhere deep inside you can barely see. Now, somebody is, the photographer's looked and they've seen, they've seen the flower. But the observer isn't seeing the flower. They haven't given you context about what they're, what they're looking at. Okay, it's a bit like taking a photograph in the middle of a thought. 
you know, I have a friend who used to call me up and uh, I'd see it's my close friend and I'd say, hi, how are you? And she'd say, so they took the thing away and I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so what, what, what are you talking about? Well, they, they took the thing away. So what thing are you talking about? You're, you're in the middle of a thought. Share with me the, excuse me, share with me the thought. Well, the washing machine broke and I asked for the technician to come around. It's the same thing with a photograph. Give context, otherwise it has no meaning, right? Okay, and uh, the rest has to do with engaging with people. Include your subjects in the process. It's nice for you, it's nice for them, they will cooperate more, you'll get better pictures, right? Offer them copies of the pictures, ask their permission. Do it so that you're happy and they're happy. If somebody's not happy, there's no point. That's not what life's about. Embrace happiness in your life. I don't know how often I told that to people and they don't get it. Don't stalk people. You know, street photographers <coughs> come around and they're constantly stalking people. That's, that's not the point. Don't stalk people. It's meant, to be, it's meant to be happy. Never regret a lost photo opportunity. This we spoke about, about before. And the very, very last thing is take as many photos as you can because in digital it doesn't make any difference you can delete them straight after and the second rule is delete as many as you can <laughs> you need to take tons and delete tons in fact i take many 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 photos and then i go through all of the pictures and i just click the, the one or two or three that i want to keep and then just delete the rest and i do it as soon as possible so that i don't get sentimental about it so I will show you now, um, we've got another 10 minutes, mm -hmm. is that okay? Um, I will uh, just show you from my exhibit, let's see if I can uh, grab that up, whoops, what am I looking at? Um, something's disappeared here, let's take it from there, sorry about this, no that's not going to work here, let's do this. That's not going to help either. So what I'm doing now is talking a lot, just like on an aerobics video, and that way the audience keeps engaged in some manner. And there we go. Okay. So this is the exhibit that I just put up. And uh, it's travelling around the world. Uh, it's not into the first one, but it doesn't make any difference. Now, what I do with my street photography is I, uh, I like to have a compare and contrast. This is actually a little bit distorted. His, his head isn't... He looks like he's just come out of somebody's birthing canal, but it, it's, it's not quite the case. <laughs> but not to worry. Um, I like to get into, like I said, into the experience that somebody has gone through. And I like to always take two photographs and put them together. So in my book, of which I have some copies here, so in my book I have each, each two pages has photographs that are of, a, of uh, a similar concept. Visually they're similar and you can see how people are going through a very similar experience even though they're totally different experiences. And you start to see how different segments of society are connected by experience that they would never have thought of. So that's, that's what I have done in this book, which I love. This, this is about Jerusalem specifically. It's called uh, Distilling Jerusalem, Portraits of the City at Many Given Moments, because it's about capturing a particular experience at particular moments. Um, this exhibit is, the, is, is similar, but it's about Israel altogether. Oops, excuse me. So, so here's a kid, obviously, on the beach. Now, can you imagine what equipment I used to take that photograph? Can anybody think? Did I use my phone? Did I use my camera? Did I use... My camera, right? I mean, it's quite clear, isn't it? Why? What's the... What are you noticing? Uh, noticing the jewel-like effect of the... Um... Of the bubbles. Of the bubbles down the here, right? Light. Down yeah. here, is that what you're referring and to? And the speed that you might have used to capture the movie. It's all different levels of observance, if you look at it. Different levels of, of observance. Could be different levels of smoking by the looks of it. 
very interesting. This is, yeah. They don't look like real smokers. They're sort of like doing it for the effect of it rather than being smoking. Isn't that interesting? Believe me, they were smoking and they were high as a kite. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we know yes. that the person, I use the word person for reason in the next yes, sentence, yes. is on the left, is a, most probably a man, but if a, non, if a person who didn't know the, the dress may assume that's four women. But somebody might assume that that's four women because we know that this is a man in a very strange situation. Except... Except it is a woman. But this is a woman! <laughs> and if you have a look here, you can see her fingernails are very long. There we go, you see. <laughs> so this was taken on Purim. Ah. And I was walking down the street and this one here, the girl, these girls are laughing, and this one here is doing this, walking up and down the street like this. And I took some photos and it was very amusing, and I said, hey guys, can I, can I take your photos? And they got excited about it. And then they, they, they just sort of went into this little position. Uh, and, and I said, no, if you straighten up a bit, I'm going to take this. And of course I did. And uh, I adore that. And you can see each one of them is decorated in some fashion for Purim. Um, but that, of course, does not derogate from the fact that they were high as a kite. <laughs> okay. This one also speaks to me enormously. Let's see if I can make that a little more visual. Oops. Yeah. Does anybody know where that is? Haifa. Haifa's an interesting guess. So that is actually in Jerusalem. This is in the uh, neighborhood of Enkari. And I took this at the, what they call the Moscovy Church, the, ch the, the Russian Orthodox Church, which is a whole village in itself. Um, now, in the background here, you've got, uh, you've got a Bedzait, which is a, a Moshav, and there's a winter lake there. I don't know if you can see, that's actually water. It's difficult to see in the black and white. That's, that, that's, that's a, a winter lake. It, it, it only collects water during the winter. And these are two of the uh, nuns who are from the convent there. And I just love the fact that I'm looking at them from behind and their lack, my lack of seeing their eyes, draws me into the whole picture. Because if I do that, it's a nice picture. But when I do that, it brings me into this whole experience. It's beautiful. That's my feeling. So that's, um, this one was the, when, when this exhibit was, uh, was displayed in Jerusalem, this was my third exhibit in Jerusalem, um, uh, this was the, the uh, front or the publicity uh, photograph. Why? Because it's so unusual. Does that, can anybody imagine what's going on there? Mm, yes. Dancing? Dancing is right. Can anybody imagine why? This man is significantly older than her, by the way, and he is significantly older than her. Not that that may be relevant. <laughs> so. I'll, I'll tell you that it was taken in the Tanya. All these red herrings. So this was just after they announced that lockdown, the last lockdown was over. <laughs> and a whole lot of people came down to the beach put on big speakers with music, and just started dancing away. Didn't and happen I... in Leeds. <laughs> what was that, sorry? Didn't happen in Leeds. No. <laughs> and when I, took this, when I took these photos, they knew I was taking their photos. I didn't need any release forms. They were happy for me to be sitting there taking their photos. And it's just an adorable, adorable picture. And I'm so excited that I got these guys in this position. This just does it all, doesn't it? It looks... Gay abandon. Gay abandon is exactly what it was. That's exactly what it was. It was so exciting. I'd love to tell you that I took off my shoes and I hopped in with them, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> because I knew that in a second there would be another photo to take. This also is one of my favorite photos. Now this gentleman is actually this fellow here. He appears a couple of times in the book. I met him in the gardens. He is an international flautist. His name is, or flautist, however you pronounce it. Uh, his name is Roy Amotz. He grew up in Jerusalem. He lives in Berlin. Now, he came to play at the community gardens for uh, an event. 
um, he's, he does things a little bit differently to others. So he was in the... Um, uh, he, he played amongst the trees for us. It was very beautiful. I, there's a video on my YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. There's a video on my YouTube channel of that. Um, it's, it's very, very nice. Now, I said to him after I recorded him the first time, I said, listen, can, I, can we go out and have some fun with photos? He said, absolutely. So this is on the bridge at the entrance to Jerusalem. Okay, it's called the Bridge of Strings, or the Calabatra Bridge, uh, named after the designer. And we took that photo. Now, when I took this photo, when I was processing it, I understood there's a whole concept of lines. You want your eye to be drawn by something. So I made sure that he was sitting here where all of these lines bring you towards him. And it works very well. This is the cover of his new album that he, uh, that he just put out. It looks like the things we used to use for perspective. Uh, all the lines that you, you get perspective writing. You mean like prism, the uh, prism type? Central, central perspective. Yes, yes. Exactly. This is just a fun photo. This guy come, this group of uh, knights come to, to uh, practice their, uh, uh, what do you call it? It's, uh, not fencing. There's another word for it when it's not jousting. a... No, jousting. It's a sort of more of a jousting type of thing. But I did, I did process this picture, even though I took it in JPEG in that uh, more difficult mode. Uh, I did change it so that you could see the expression on his face because uh, as the photo came out, his face was very uh, covered. You couldn't see it properly. Um, but the expression on his face for me, that's what makes this photo. So I managed to get that out. Um, this was uh, my mother and two kids who came to the gardens and they, they were just having fun. And that's also a very just daily experience. It's a very calm picture. It brings you back to your childhood. I know that I've gone way over time, so I'm, I'm almost finished. Um, this also, I love. Now, I have this very strategically placed in the book, if you decide to, to look at the book. Um, what's so special about this? I love the way, I love firstly the, 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 the colours, the shading gives it a special feel. I like the fact that it's in mid-step. And if you look on the internet, there are all sorts of tips for photographers how to make, make people look like they're in mid-step. But here I actually got him in mid-step, which is nice. And Jerusalem people who look usually are switched on by the fact that he's standing in front of a sexy lingerie store. <laughs> you see it says Intima? That's the name of the... We don't need to go there for the moment. But... Now this photo actually matches up. I don't know if you recall, there was a photo I took at night of a girl with a light in her laptop. That was in a, taken in a bar. And uh, this also, I saw this and I said, oh, I've got to do this. It just reminds me of a Woody Allen film. Yeah. It's got that feeling, doesn't it? Where you're looking at the different relationships that are going on. It makes you start to think, what are they talking about? What are they? And you feel like you're there. This was taken outside of, outside of a, a, a shul, which is also a mikveh in uh, Mount Shaarim, and I went specially just before Yom Tov because uh, I could drive in and uh, I knew that people would be all dressed up for Yom Tov. And as people were coming out, I realised it was a mikveh and I thought, this is just not right. So I didn't take any photos, except this one in the mirror of my car. <laughs> you can actually see this white line here is my, it's the top of my window, which is slightly lowered. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's it from those photos. So, anyway, look, I'll stop it there because I've been um, blabbing on. But, um, yes, so it's called Quotidian from daily life because that's really what I'm trying to do. I want to introduce people to the idea of understanding life and place by engaging with other people. And in this sense, we spoke before about engaging uh, with them personally, but here, now we're engaging with them from a distance. It's not just a photo. It's an introduction to an experience. That's how I see street photography. So that's my story.